Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so I'm going to be reading 1 John chapter 4, uh, verse 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is, form, is from God. <clears throat> and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you, ha which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God, and you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of, the tr of truth and the spirit of error. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Trying something a little bit different this time, so I'm hoping it goes well. <laughs> Not using Microsoft this time. We'll see what happens. Glad to be here with you again this morning. Um, I was reading a, an article yesterday about a minister in, a, I think he was in Texas, a little small town in Texas. And he, before he got up to preach, this, uh, I think it was last Sunday, before he got up to preach, he was, uh, he asked everybody, he's like, how many of you read through Mark chapter 17, like I asked in preparation for the sermon today? A whole bunch of people raised their hands. Or, and he's looking around, he's like, well, that's, that's good, because Mark only has 16 chapters. So this topic of this sermon will be about lying. <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, we live in some truly unique times, don't we, on, on so many levels. No, no other human civilization, you know, has access to every bit of information known to man, and it's, you know, right here in our pockets. The naive kind of overly optimistic part of me wonders how, as a society, we could possibly be divided on anything or when we can simply, you know, take a few minutes to look up anything, right? Unfortunately, that's just not the way the world works. These days, it seems to me that uh, there's at least, at least the same amount of misinformation out there as there is, you know, useful, helpful information. And with access to all that information, how do we discern what's helpful or harmful in our lives? What's useful information versus disinformation? What's a good and wholesome versus what's evil and depraved? And how can we effectively spread the message of the gospel in this day and age? So I want to talk about some of that from a spiritual and a you know, worldly standpoint, but also how it applies to us as Christians. You know, as Christians, understanding what is good and evil, I think, is fairly straightforward, isn't it? We have God's inerrant word, and he tells us through numerous authors what is good, what's righteous, moral behavior, and what he finds detestable. We know his standard. That doesn't mean we're perfect or we don't stumble. I know I'm far from, from perfect. But when it comes to things in our lives that aren't so straightforward, you know, what, what should we do? I think the Apostle Paul gives us perfect advice in 1 Thessalonians a letter that is all about living the right way in view of the second coming of Jesus. And in chapter 5, starting in verse 19, Paul says, Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good, and abstain from every form of evil. 
you know, test everything. When I when I read that, when I when I think about that, what goes through my mind is Paul telling us that God gave us the intellect to consider various situations in our lives and to react to those situations accordingly. Of course, keeping in mind what it says in Proverbs chapter three, that trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. The focus shouldn't be on our will or my will, but God's will. For a lot of you, I imagine you've had a lot of practice discerning and biblically testing things around you in your lives. But for me, a younger Christian, I feel as though I'm still learning, still coming across things that I need to pray about because sometimes I lack that wisdom and understanding. And honestly, the longer that goes on, the more I believe that that's, that's the point, to spend the rest of my life, you know, humbly going to God in prayer in various situations in my life. And part of that thought for me is, I think I have a fear of being too comfortable. And if I get too comfortable, I may start to feel like I've got everything figured out. And the last thing I want to do is look at people differently or, or even worse, treat people differently because somehow I look at myself as more moral or virtuous than someone else or, you know, more virtuous than I really am. You know, as I said, Christians, you know, thankfully we, we have God's objective standard with us, right? To guide us in our daily lives. He has graciously, graciously given us his expectations. We definitely don't have to go through the, this life alone and confused. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But if we look around the world today, loneliness, confusion, and fear seem to be, you know, some of the biggest problems, the biggest emotions that people are dealing with today. You could argue that loneliness is due to the pandemic, you know, shutdowns, quarantines, but I think we've seen a plague of loneliness long before the pandemic, right? Social media and technology have taken away a lot of that face-to-face -face communications that we used to have. With technology, we have, that, we have ability to communicate with, with more people at once, right? Everyone's voice can be potentially heard by millions, but we've lost that personal connection to a certain extent overall. Along with that, people seem to be more confused, not sure who to trust, what to believe, where to go when they need help. This confusion can, lead, can you know, then perpetuate fear, both rational and irrational. And according to the nonprofit Mental Health America, nearly 50 million American adults are just shy of 20% of our adult population experienced a mental illness in 2019. And I'd be willing to bet those numbers are a lot higher in 2020 and 2021. Loneliness, confusion, fear aren't emotions unique to us in this day and age. For the people that, that don't make God a priority in their lives, how are they dealing with these emotions? People seem to be latching onto anything these days, don't they? Have you heard people today say things like, well, that's your truth? I've seen comments online and on TV where people say that. And it's, it's so bizarre to hear people say that because unless we're living in the multiverse where there's an infinite number of realities, in my mind, there's only one truth. It reminds me of the interaction, the interaction between Jesus and Pilate. In chapter 18 of the Gospel of John, starting in verse 36, Jesus is trying to explain that spiritual kingdom to Pilate. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my service would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And Pilate says, so you're a king? And Jesus says, you say I'm a king. For this purpose I was born. For this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is, is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate, what does he say? What is truth? Well, we know what the truth is, don't we? If we go back a few chapters in the Gospel of John, we see that Jesus is the truth. Had Pilate tested everything with a, from a spiritual perspective, had he held on to what was good, perhaps he, wouldn't have treated Je he, perhaps he would have treated Jesus differently. Perhaps he wouldn't have succumbed to the mob that wanted to crucify him. Perhaps he would have thought for himself. Instead, he sounds like one of the people I just described. Well, that's your truth, right? Right. 
Pilate's actions, I think, are a good example for us to learn, to learn from in our, in our lives when we try to put God first. And it makes me wonder, you know, does God want us to blindly obey him? You know, years ago before reading the Bible, I probably would have said yes, but I don't believe that anymore. I think one of the stories we find in the Bible that appears to suggest that God wants us to blindly obey him can be found in chapter 22 of Genesis. In verse 2, God tells Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering, one of the, on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Now Abraham, he doesn't seem to hesitate. He grabs what he needs, he takes Isaac to the place where God told him, but before he could do it, and starting in verse 11, he says, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know you fear God, seeing you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. We aren't given a whole lot of insight into Abraham's thinking here, but we can see that he absolutely trusted God, right? But if we flip over to chapter 11 in Hebrews, we're given a lot more information concerning Abraham's point of view, kind of what he was thinking. In verse 17, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only, his, his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead. We see that Abraham did not act without thinking. He fully trusted God and used his ability to reason and remembered God's promise to Isaac in Genesis, a few chapters before in Genesis 17. He says, it says Sarah, your, your wife shall bear you a son, and you should call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his, for his offspring after him. Abraham spiritually tested everything, I think. He used his ability to reason. He absolutely trusted God, like I just said. I, I don't believe God wants us to mindlessly obey him. I think he gives us uh, everything that we need, and I believe he wants us to have faith and trust in him. And just like Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. But that being said, I think it's logical to assume that God doesn't want us to blindly follow or obey anyone or anything without reasoning and testing. I think a healthy dose of skepticism is good to have in many situations. Now, how do people get involved in cults? Perhaps an overwhelming need to belong to something bigger than ourselves? But I'd argue a certain lack of judgment, right? And a lack of understanding of who God is. I mean, if I knew nothing about Scientology, and I walked in there trying to learn more, and the first thing they do is sit me down, give me a couple of metal cans to hold on to that are plugged into a machine, and they start asking me deeply personal questions as they're writing down my answers, I think I'd be like, mm, this might not be the place for me. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Along these lines, have you seen news articles advising people to not do your own research or warning against the pitfalls of doing your own research? To be fair, these articles are referring to the pandemic, and I know what they're trying to say. Since most of us, including myself, aren't doctors or virologists, we need to rely on the experts, right? Nobody should be going to Eric's coronaviruscures.com for, you know, for, to, to figure this out, right? <clears throat> but what happens, you know, what happens when the experts don't all agree? Should we ask questions? Should we read some articles, some peer-reviewed articles from some doctors? Should we talk to our personal doctor? Should we seek a second opinion? Maybe. It could just be me, but don't do your own research sounds suspiciously like, let us do your thinking for you. Did you see the article recently about Facebook admitting that their fact checks are opinion? Or have you noticed that it seems like every group with an agenda claims to have science on their side? Perhaps these are indications that we shouldn't take everything at face value and test everything and not blindly follow anything or anyone. Yeah, I see all of this, and all I can think about is that there's an all-out war on information that's going on in our, in our country and around the world today. But what's it doing to people? It doesn't seem to be uniting us. Division seems to be the norm in our culture, doesn't it? Tribalism, the us versus them, 
And what's strange to me is how it's not just in our country, but it's everywhere. The devil is alive and well, isn't he? In our country, everything is politicized. As I look around the sinful world, perhaps now more than ever, we need to be testing everything. We need to look at everything from that biblical perspective. But how can we test everything and be part of, and not be part of that division, that cancel culture, all that hate that's going on in our society? How can we effectively spread the message of the gospel in this day and age? I think, that, I think Paul gives us a, a great example of how we should behave toward others in the sinful world, especially those that don't hold the same views that we do. In Acts chapter 17, we see a lot of, we see a few examples of Paul and Silas preaching in synagogues in Thessalonica and Berea. In Thessalonica, in verse 2, it says, Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and die. Suffer, I'm sorry, and, and rise from the dead. Saying, this Jesus who I proclaim to you is the Christ. It goes on to say that there were some that were persuaded, but a lot of the Jews were jealous, formed a mob, and accused them of going against Caesar. And Paul and Silas then went to Berea, where again, where they, uh, they went to preach in the synagogues. And in uh, verse 11, it says, Now these Jews were more, more, normal, normal, more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see these things, if these things were, true, were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. A little while later, Paul finds himself in Athens after the Jews from Thessalonica followed him down to Berea. And I think this is where things get really interesting. Paul starts preaching in the synagogue in Athens, but not only that, he's preaching in the, in the marketplaces for anyone to hear. Even though he saw all these Athenian idols around him, he didn't immediately tell them that they're, that they're wrong for what they believed, right? He, he learned or he knew a little bit about their culture. And he explains to them about their unknown God. He even quotes two Greek writers instead of the Old Testament because of who his audience was. In verse 28, there are two footnotes that say that Paul is likely quoting from <laughs> Epimenides of Crete and a poem of er by Eratus. I've been working on that word all week. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's an important example to follow when we're having conversations with unbelievers. I, think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing to necessarily learn a little bit about what they believe so that we can have a meaningful conversation with these people and explain the truth about God and who Jesus is in a way they can understand. Uh, the Apostle Peter tells us in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who ask you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, because we will be, right? Those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. The gentleness and respect is important because if we try to force forcefully communicate with people, our message probably isn't going to go very far. With these thoughts and examples in mind, I don't want to shy away from trying to understand what an atheist believes uh, you know, a New Age or a Mormon, a, Jehovah, his, a Jehovah's Witness, or any other preach, person preaching no Jesus or a false Jesus. Because I want to be able to have that meaningful conversation. But of course, they need to be willing to have that conversation as well, right? I know atheists that'll tell anyone that'll listen that religion and Christianity specifically is for weak-minded people or people in desperate life situations that turn to God. Only those people. You know what they avoid considering is that there are people out there seeking the truth and looking for answers that nobody can explain. Like how did we get here? What are we supposed to be doing while we're here? And what's going to happen to us when we die? Now these atheists and a lot of people, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say they have those answers, right? But when we, when we really dig into what they're saying and peel it back, it's all theory. But in their minds, these theories are enough evidence to convince them that they have all the answers and God is not real. The psychology behind that is fascinating to me. It's very interesting. But I firmly believe we need to keep talking to these people and planting those seeds, right? Especially since faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We're studying 1 Corinthians in the, in the building here.
on Wednesday nights. And one of the things that stuck with me that Paul says is, uh, he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. As much as I enjoy trying to understand what people believe, you can go down some crazy, weird rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. I came across a video on TikTok where a woman claims to be a Christian witch. Um, now, I've never used TikTok, so this was actually a, a, an apologetics podcast that I was listening to, and they, they showed it. But I, I want to highlight this because for a couple of reasons. You'll see it here in a second. She says, this is part of what she says. She says, I identify as a Christian witch and a Christian mystic. She goes on to say that Christians see a pretty big contradiction in that statement, shockingly, and talks a little bit about, um, uh, she talks a little bit about that, but then she ends by saying, and the reason I still identify as a Christian and a Christian witch and mystic is that I follow the teachings of Yeshua, who is a Buddhist, by the way. If you follow Jesus, you're definitely familiar with witchcraft. <laughs> you know, I don't, I, I don't know where to begin with this, but maybe <laughs> the first thing that comes to my mind is Deuteronomy chapter 18, where God tells us not to practice divination or tell fortunes or interpret omens or be a sorcerer or a medium. And Jesus being a Buddhist is an odd claim, isn't it? Buddhists believe that, pe that everybody's stuck in a... Uh, a cycle of suffering and rebirth. And the only way to break that cycle is to achieve enlightenment, which is done through meditation among a, a bunch of other things. And I, I, so I may have missed it, but I don't remember Jesus ever saying anything like that in the gospels. But I wanted to highlight this because my first reaction when I saw this and heard this was, you know, anger and frustration. How could somebody possibly say these things? But what do you think would happen if I confronted her in that anger, right? This woman would probably likely entrench herself further in her beliefs, and she'd probably refuse to listen to what I have to say. You know, this is a pretty extreme example, but as Christians, you know, we, we must test everything and hold on to, to what is good so we don't fall victim to things like this. Now, again, pretty extreme example. And if we engage in conversations with people like this, I think it's important to do it with that gentleness and respect, like Peter said so that the truth can be made clear. The devil is cunning, isn't he? I, I have a feeling he's been lying to that woman for a long time. As Christians, we're not immune from, his, from that deception. Uh, Scott, you talked about that with the, uh, this morning, and it's funny. Some of you guys, man, before I come up here, it's like you guys, it, we're on point with things. Because the Apostle Peter's advice, this is perfect what I was going to bring up. He says, uh, you know, in chapter 5, verse 8 of First Peter, he says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around you like a lion, like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being expressed, experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered... A little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will restore, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. We cannot let the devil get a foothold in our minds. We cannot let our guard down. We need to do our best to see his work for what it is. Has anyone, anyone ever listened to uh, Paul Harvey's broadcast years ago called If I Were the Devil? When you, if you haven't heard it and you have time, listen to it. It's only a few minutes long. Um, it was written. Uh, it was written more than 60 years ago. Now, I won't quote the whole thing, but I want to highlight a few things that he said. He starts off by saying, "If I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. From the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, 'Do as you please.' To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would con I would confide." that what's bad is good and what's good is square. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves, until each in its turn was consumed. And with the promises of higher ratings, I'd, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. Wow. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have, give to those who want, until I have killed the incentive of the ambitious, I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, and that what you see on TV is the way to be. 
And he ends it by saying, if I were the devil, I'd just keep on doing what he's doing. I may have mentioned this before, so forgive me. But when I was younger, I had a very Hollywood idea of what of who the devil was, is a red figure, horns, hooves for feet, a pitchfork, you know, a monster. But how does Jesus describe him? In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says he was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. No doubt we need to see the devil for who he, for who he really is, right? And we need to test everything if we're to recognize the devil's working out first, in the first place. And what we think in our mind, you know, it affects us spiritually and, and, and physically. We need to keep our spiritual defenses up, like I said, and we need to, um, when we feel the devil whispering to us, we need to remember what the Apostle John said, what Sean read a little bit ago. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. I think, you know, if we keep that in mind, if we continue to test everything, hold on to what is good, if we trust God and our foundation is in Christ with God's inerrant word as our objective standard, I don't think we can go wrong. Amen. You know, if there is something on your mind today, if you have any needs of the church, please come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Oh, holy land of